So edge triggering is great and all, using pulses instead of a clock to make sure that the timing works out, but it's kind of stressful in my mind to be relying on these timings, no matter how tightly it's engineered. The other way you can get a JK flip-flop to be stable and rational and well-behaved is to use something called a JK Master Slave flip-flop or a Master Slave JK flip-flop. This uses more transistors and it uses more transistors for every single bit of memory that you're implementing this way. Whereas if you're using a clock pulse generator, you can just generate the pulse once and plug it into all of them. So it's obviously much more expensive in terms of parts and board space. So you can see why you would want to use the pulse generation. But if you have the board space and parts to spare, I like this method and it's deviously simple. So a master slave flip-flop is so named because you actually have two flip-flops, a master and a slave. The master flip-flop is the one that takes the signal that we want the entire construct to be using and the slave is controlled by the master, the slave has the output of the entire construct. So imagine, if you will, we have a JK flip-flop. So we have J and we have K and we have our clock. You'll notice I did not say edge triggered. I did not put the little triangle. Now we have an SR flip-flop, which takes S, R, and our clock. Now it's, it's not S not and R not, that's internal because it's got the latch that takes S not R not, but the little control layer. It's got the two extra NAND gates. That's what inverts it. So this takes the normal S and R that are high when they want to be on. The output from this one is our actual output, Q and not Q. So when we set, when we say J, the output here, Q is going to be high. When we say K as our reset, Q not is high, Q is low. Instead of calling this Q and not Q, I'm going to call it A. A and not A. Because normally, the JK flip-flop has an internal connection, right? The input to J is the actual J out here, is the clock, and it's your not Q. And the connection to the K would be the actual K, the clock, and the A, the Q. But I'm going to hook it up differently. So I'm going to put Q not in parentheses here and Q in parentheses here. Instead of being connected to its own A not here, it's connected to this one over here, as if we had a wire. And of course, you'd actually have a wire using transistors. It's the SR flip-flops Q not that is going to the J connection, the J NAND gate in the JK flip-flop. So the feedback stretches between the two. We're going to use A and not A as S and R. And there's one more thing. This is not clock. It's not clock. That was a brain twister, wasn't it? This is taking the regular clock signal. This is taking an inverted clock signal, not a delayed one. I mean, it'll be delayed if you use an inverter, but only a small delay, but the inverted clock signal. So we have Q and not Q as pins. We have those as pins and this is pins. And we could just say, if we want, if we have the clock going in here, then here is not clock. It's just an inverter. So you could have your actual clock line, plug it directly into C and then plug it into an inverter and that into the not C. So the point of inverting the clock is when the clock is high, this flip-flop is on and this one's off because if the clock is high, inverted clock is low. So this flip-flop gets the JK signal and the clock signal does its thing, but it doesn't feed back into itself. There's no chance for it to accidentally, with any timing, go back to itself. It does not have any internal wires other than, you know, the, the embedded SR latch, which just, it works fine. It's only feedback out, not back to the inputs. So this one is gonna change when the clock is high, but this one's got a low clock. So while it's changing, this one is chilling and it's ignoring everything this one is saying. Then once it's settled and you time your clock to make sure it has time to settle, the clock goes low, which means this clock goes high. So this flip-flop turns off and this one turns on. So this flip-flop, which is receiving the stable finalized A and not A, processes that because it's getting a high clock signal. It processes it and sets Q and not Q and Q and not Q start changing and feeding back into here, but the clock signal was low. It's high over here because of the inverter, but it's low over here. So despite Q and not Q changing wildly, perhaps, this flip-flop is disabled. So it's not going to be changing. And so you get it in lockstep. And you think about the clock signal. It takes time. If you use an inverter, it takes time, but this is one gate. Whereas the JK, 
if we have this set up, in order for it to go wrong, it has to get through two gates. So one gate is probably going to be short enough. A nice quick inverter to get this to turn off before this one changes A and not A. Now one thing I saw, because remember, this is just transistors. Your NAND gate, remember a video I did a while ago where we took like a NAND gate and we flipped one of the transistors from NPN to PNP as an inverter, which does not change the number of transistors, but we got goofy voltage numbers so it didn't work right. If you use only one flipped from NPN to PNP, you'll goof up your number, but it's just like before. You'll just have your low and high not be proper, but they'll still be completely predictable, which means you'll have to use the right transistor to drive the other end. Instead of getting low, you'll get like 0.7. Instead of getting zero, you'll get like 0.7. So that means you have to drive a PNP with it instead of an NPN. So let me make it a little more clear by showing you this with the logic gates. This time we need eight NAND gates, and I'll do them some way. Let's do them like so. So over here we have our JK flip-flop. So one NAND gate takes the J signal, it takes the clock signal, and it takes the Q not signal. Then we have our second NAND, which takes the K signal, the clock signal, and the Q signal. So let's call this signal M and the signal N. And then I have the two outputs. This is the this is the control portion of the JK, and this is the SR latch that's inside the JK. So the output of here would be A. The output of here would be A naught. So this takes as its input M and not A, and this takes as its input N and A. It's just the standard JK flip-flop. The only difference between the JK flip-flop we have here and the one I showed you last time is that the Q is coming from the SR flip-flop rather than here, because otherwise you'd have A here and A naught here. That's the only difference. So then we have the SR flip-flop. Actually, I'm silly. I guess it would be more clear to say S and R, wouldn't it? That would work better because the output here is actually S and the output here is R. So we have M and R and N and S. Wish I'd thought of that sooner, but anyway, you get the idea. So this is S and R. These are plugged into the SR flip-flop. So S goes in there and R goes in there, but our inverted clock goes in both. These take the regular, these take the inverted. And then your outputs here will be Q and not Q, which there's your not Q and there's your Q. So I'll just call this one A and this one B. So this one takes A and not Q. This one takes B and Q. This way is a little hard to see. I mean, you can sit here and look at it and it makes perfect sense, but you don't glance at it and immediately see the structure. That's why I showed you with the two connected flip-flops first. But the point of it was just to show you that it's just like what we've seen before. So we've got three input, three input, two and two, two and two, two and two. So it's two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 15, 18. So that's 18 transistors to make this. But remember, we can share things. The clock here, we can share a transistor. So that brings it to 17. And we can, of course, do the same thing here. We can share the clock with one transistor. So that brings it to 16. So we've gone from nine to 16 transistors. That is a big bump, which is why you might want to use pulse detection, edge detection pulses to save yourself transistors. Obviously, if you're trying to make, you know, four gigabytes of RAM using JK flip-flops, then you'd want to save transistor space. But this is the safe way. This is the clock agnostic method. And this is where I also wanted to show you about flipping the clock. So if we kind of look at our gate, you've got your normal NAND gate, which has got your resistor and your output, your two NPNs and your connection to negative. So this is your NAND gate. So let's say this is this NAND gate. So you've got S going in here and not C going in here. So you've got your S signal and your inverted clock going in here. If we change this to a PNP, it acts as an inverter. If we put the regular clock signal in here, instead of putting it to an inverter, we just put the regular in here, the PNP inverts it because the PNP conducts on low instead of high. So effectively, it's inverting, but it'll goof up your voltage. When the NPN signal is low, when the NPN is off, when they're both off, you're getting high out of here, your nice five volts or whatever. If the NPN is conducting, the PNP is not, you're still getting your nice five because there's no leakage. Remember when we tried to flip the resistor down and make an AND gate out of a NAND gate, we got leakage if one of the gates happened to be on, but the rest were off. We don't get leakage here because the NPN is next to the resistor. There's no leakage. If we had the PNP first, there 
there would be leakage. But with the NPN on and the PNP off, there's still no leakage. With the NPN off and the PNP on, there's still no leakage because the emitter is not getting any current, so nothing can come out of the base. So we're still getting our high. If both of these are on, then we get our low, but if we look at our Kirchhoff loop, we go from positive, so we get five volts, we have an unknown voltage drop there. We have an effectively zero voltage drop collected to emitter on the NPN, but while we do have a, an effectively zero drop from emitter to collector on the PNP as well, we have emitter to base, it's got a diode drop. So that's gonna bring that up. So instead of getting zero volts, we'll get about 0.7 volts, which means we can't drive NPNs, but we can drive PNPs. If this is plugged into a PNP, the signal will still be proper. 0.7 will turn it on just the same as zero will. We don't care about the amplification. It just has to be strong enough to turn it on. This is binary logic, on or off. We're not worried about the exact current going through. We're gonna get five and about 0.7 if we do this, but we save a transistor and we save delay. It'll be faster because we're saving not having to go through the inverter. It'll be inverted by this with less delay. And I showed you how you can make your SR flip-flop components out of PNPs or NPNs, and then you just have to make sure those are plugged into the right ones. So whether or not you do this depends on how complex it makes your circuitry. If you're using MOSFETs, as usual, it's not a problem. And you might say, well, why do you keep saying that? You have to do all this stuff, and you always say, but if you use MOSFETs, it's not a problem, but we're using BJTs. Because MOSFETs are delicate. MOSFETs that's can actually fry in your hand from electrical static discharge, ESD. And even integrated circuits will. The CMOS chips, that's why you gotta be careful around chips. But these transistors I throw around all the time, I haven't burned a single one except for the one that I left plugged in backwards to five volts for half a day. That one went bad. But you can, you can throw BJTs off the wall and they'll just go wee, and you don't have to worry about it. That's why I keep harping on BJTs here. If you're actually doing complex engineering and you wanna make some amazing product, you're going to make a CMOS IC and you're going to use your MOSFETs and, you know, more complex circuits than this, but, you know, fundamentally the same with just a few additions. So then you will be using MOSFETs and life will be overall easier. But this is for two things. It's for learning and it's for hobby work. Hobby work, we're not as concerned with compactness because we're making devices for us. You know, if I make a big old box and it could be smaller, but I didn't feel like it, I just put it in the corner and don't look at it. And also... BJTs in bulk are really cheap. MOSFETs, funnily enough, are probably going to be cheaper, but they'll also fry when you're just messing around with breadboards and, and you don't really have good facilities for ESD because when you have a circuit board, it's going to have resistors and capacitors all over it, and they're going to even structure the traces to make sure to drain ESD out through resistors to waste it as heat or whatever, and there's all kinds of other mechanisms and making sure it's case grounded and all this. There's engineering that goes into making a device resistant to electrostatic discharge. This is why PCs don't fry all the time because of all the static electricity all over them. Usually they're nicely case grounded and when you touch it, it sinks it to the power supply and out the grounding plug or something. So that's why BJTs and that's why I keep saying you have these difficulties you have to keep track of. On the other hand, it might be a pain in the butt, but it's a little more challenge, isn't it? When you're not trying to beat a deadline and get a project done, when you're just trying to make something, fiddle for it around and see what you can do. It's like playing a video game on hard instead of normal. You don't get anything out of it except for fun. So while you think about that, I'll be seeing you.